All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this class is transitioning to other levels and those that are left behind. And we have with us today, Julianne Ralph. She's our social worker for independent living. So welcome, Julianne. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me here today. Um, I was asked to talk about transitioning to different levels of care um, and the effect and resources available for spouses of those. So I wanted to start off with just some basic resources um, that are available to you as Holland Homers. Um, understanding senior living options. A common problem older adults identify is difficulty with activities of daily living or ADLs. In the first slide, sorry. All right, we got it. Next slide, please. Um, ADLs include things such as bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, and mobility. Having problems with ADLs without intervention leads to disability, dependence, and the need for more care. That is what we want to try to avoid. Being proactive and getting care in early can help your loved one to stay independent for as long as safely possible. Next slide, please. Interventions. There are many options available to older adults to keep them stay as independent as possible for as long as possible. Asking for help before a crisis occurs is key. Waiting too long to get help will negatively impact ability to recover to full independence. Next slide. Uh, there are many different types of interventions, but they can include the following. Private duty home care, Medicare Part B, outpatient therapy rehab, Medicare Part A, post hospitalization care and home health care, assisted living, memory care assisted living, skilled nursing, memory care skilled nursing, hospice care, and palliative care. The first go-to typically if there's someone that's needing some extra help is private duty home care. Um, there's a menu of services that can be purchased for a fee. All services are private pay and can include personal care, life enrichment, care coordination, housework, respite care, medication setup and reminders, meal preparation, transportation and errand services, monitoring options such as pers personal emergency response systems, and medication dispensers. <coughs> Long-term care insurance, automobile and liability insurances may pay for these services, but you'd have to check with your insurance provider for that. Next slide please. Medicare Part B provides outpatient rehab for skilled services in an outpatient clinic, doctor's office, assisted living facility, or skilled nursing facility. Now the skilled services would include like a physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, that sort of thing that would be considered skilled therapy. Um, services are provided for persons who are not confined to their homes. Coverages vary, again, based on the type of Medicare policy that you would have. Um, then there is Medicare Part A, Skilled Nursing Facility Rehab Care. Coverage varies based on the type of Medicare. Typically, a qualifying stay in the hospital is required, but not for all insurances. Um, also, I know there's a COVID wa waiver that they've had in effect for quite some time due to the pandemic. So that typically, if you have traditional Medicare, you would have to have a three-day stay in a hospital in order for your Medicare Part A to kick in. But now with, um, with the COVID waiver, they are waiving those three-day stays for a lot of people. So that's good to know. Um, Medicare can have coverage for skilled care Typically, rehab is less than 20 days, and oftentimes at day 21, the coverage is less, increasing out-of-pocket costs, unless you have a supplemental insurance that would cover the difference there, which a lot of people do have. 
Medicare Part A, again, will cover home health care, which is different from private duty care. That The home health care, that would, again, be those skilled services that I mentioned, um, including the skilled nursing care, mental health nursing care, medical social services, home health aides, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and registered dietitian. Coverage, again, varies based on the type of Medicare that you have. Typically, no copayment is required. Next slide, please. Physical, occupational, and speech therapy. When to ask for these services? And this is something that you would ask your doctor, and your doctor would write an order for. Um, some of the examples would be a recent surgery requiring rehab to regain function, recent hospitalization that may require strengthening and endurance, short-term illness with extended recovery time, safety concerns with walking, falls with or without hospitalization, problems with gait, balance, and dizziness, increased need for use of assisted devices, and that would be assisted devices would be like a walker or a cane, that sort of thing. Increased assistance with bathing, dressing, or eating. So that would be the ADLs that I talked about earlier. Exacerbation of chronic conditions such as Parkinson's disease, back pain, etc. Decreased food intake, weight loss, problem swallowing, or cognitive decline that would benefit from memory strategies. So there's quite a bit, quite a bit there. Next slide, please. Um, the next resource is mental health nursing. Um, when to ask for this service? And there's a lot of things that can be covered in this that probably a lot of people are not really all that aware of. So there's, there's quite a list here. Um, so for mental health nursing, again, that would be something that you would need to get a referral from your doctor. And that can include things such as beginning memory concerns that would benefit from assessment, caregiver exhaustion due to prolonged stress, separation from a spouse due to death or placement in a different level of care, difficulty adjusting to a new level of care, change in functioning or diagnosis, change in psychoactive medication or cognitive medication, Concerns with sleeping, changes in appetite, or loss of energy and motivation. Fearful, needing a lot of contact and reassurance from others. Thoughts of wanting to die, not wanting to wake up in the morning, or other self-harm thoughts. Suspicious of family, friends, or others, and cannot be reassured. Agitated behaviors not easily redirected, such as pacing, wandering, exit seeking, and or aggressive towards others. Experiencing unreal thoughts, visions, smells, or sounds. So in other words, that would be hallucinations. Anxious, overwhelming thoughts of discontent, nervousness, and or uneasiness. So again, there's a lot that that can encompass. Um, Assisted living, I get quite a bit of phone calls and questions about, about assisted living. Assisted living is a person can no longer manage on their own 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, a person requires 24 seven care at home or requires moving to a place to receive assistance with daily living tasks, such as those ADLs again, bathing, dressing, medication supervision, incontinence care, mobility, meal preparation, and housekeeping. Assistance and management with medical issues. Can still be, a person in assisted living can still be quite independent, but may need help, help with or reminders for parts of daily care to remain as independent as possible. Respite, respite stays are available with more opportunities on the Raybrook campus with a length of stay between three to 45 days. Holland Home provides temporary care tailored to meet the needs of the individual and includes assistance with activities of daily living, 
bathing, medication management, three meals a day, snacks, and enrichment activities. Home care rehab services are also available for those needing short-term stays while recovering from illness or injury. So they would come right to the assisted living facility to do those rehab services. And coverage again varies based on the type of Medicare you would have. Uh, federal law requires licensed facilities to complete an assessment that measures the person's physical, mental, and social abilities. The facility is then required to draft a plan of care that outlines the interventions needed to enable the person to reach his or her highest, highest level of functioning. Cost of care is based on an individual assessment of specific needs. Long-term care insurance, automobile, and liability insurance may help pay for these services. Otherwise, it is private pay. Um, that's another one I get questions on a lot is people with long-term care insurance or that are looking into getting long-term care insurance, will it cover assisted living? And it, it would be something, depending on the policy, that could be covered. Um, access to health and medical services, activities, meals, housekeeping, and most utilities typically included in the cost. Next slide, please. And then there's also memory care assisted living, which is on the Raybrook campus specifically. Now that's the same as assisted living, but it allows persons with memory loss to live while limiting unnecessary risks that would come along with memory problems. Care and environment are designed to support those with memory loss. Predictable schedule and added structure, increased staffing ratios, Staff is specially trained in Medicare, I'm sorry, specially trained in memory care. It's too much doubt about Medicare. Assistance with daily living tasks is provided, but independence is emphasized. Specialized dementia activity program provided that encourages social interaction, so it's specifically tailored for those with memory loss. Um, the residence is more secure with fenced walking paths, gardens and locked entrances, exits, so forth. And then it, there again, the same as regular assisted living, the cost of care for memory care assisted living is based on an individual assessment of specific needs. And again, long-term care insurance may pay for these services depending on your policy. Skilled nursing facility or we call it SNF for short. Um, that obviously requires moving to a medical facility to receive 24 seven care. The stay may be temporary or long-term. Rehab services are available for short-term stays while recovering from illness or injury paid for by Medicare Part A if conditions are met. Federal law requires SNFs to complete an assessment that measures the person's physical, mental, and social abilities. SNFs are then required to draft a plan of care that outlines the interventions needed to enable the person to reach his or her highest level of functioning. Long-term care insurance again, automobile and liability insurance, Medicare Part A and or Medicaid may pay for these services, otherwise it is private pay and I worked at um, Brett Rehab Rehabilitation and Living Center here at Home Home for about 10 years. So if you have specific questions about skilled nursing, I spent quite a bit of time there, so I can let you know. And then besides, again on the Raybrook campus, besides regular skilled nursing, they have memory care skilled nursing which is the same as skilled nursing, skilled nursing, but allows the person with memory loss to live while limiting unnecessary risks. So very similar to the memory care assisted living, but a higher level of care, more staff ratios, et cetera, than the assisted living. Um, care, envir care and environment are designed to support those with memory loss specifically. Predictable schedule and added structure is added increased staffing ratios, and staff is specially trained in memory care. Um, assistance to meet needs is provided, but independence is emphasized. 
Specialized dementia activity programming provided that encourages social interaction. The environment is secure and again, long-term care insurance, automobile and liability insurance, medi and Medicaid may pay for these services. Otherwise it's private pay. Um, hospice. The word hospice means lodging for travelers. Those who are dying are traveling a special journey and hospice care provides these travelers with companionship and loving care for the final journey of life. The focus in hospice is on trying to help each day that a person lives be the best it can be for them. Next slide, please. Hospice services provide for the total well-being of those with a life-limiting illness diagnosis, with a life-limiting illness diagnosis and their families. Specifically, um, they're looking at six months or less diagnosis. Care is provided by an interdisciplinary team focusing on emotional, physical, and spiritual support during the course of a life-limiting illness. The team consists of physicians, nurses, social workers, chaplains, home health aides, and bereavement counselors and volunteers. Um, and providing comfort and quality of life to patients enables them to participate in life as is possible for them. Next slide, please. Hospice services can be offered in any setting including home apartment, independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, or a hospice resident such as Trillium Woods, or in the hospital. Faith Hospice has less than 10% of the services delivered at Trillium, Trillium Woods. So 90% of their services are in the community, um, in other care facilities, hospitals, etc. Um, room and board at Trillium, specifically, is not covered by Medicare or Medicaid, so that would be a private pay cost. The hospice care itself is covered by Medicare and some private insurances. Right. When to ask for hospice. Life-limiting condition and a cure is not possible. Increased visit to the emergency room, hospital, or doctor's office related to disease progression. Patient's level of functioning continues to decline gradually. Patient stops eating and unintentional weight loss continues. Patient has end-stage dementia and is no longer walking, talking, or eating. Patient voices a desire for comfort care. Family desires to receive help with end-of-life issues. End-of-life care is becoming too difficult for family to manage alone. And that was something when um, there were residents at the rehab center that were on hospice. A lot of times we would recommend, you know, maybe they didn't necessarily, maybe the resident didn't necessarily need that extra care, but maybe the family really needed that extra care. They needed that chaplain and they needed those bereavement services afterwards and that sort of thing. So hospice has been very helpful for that. Next slide, slide please. And then there is palliative care, which can be just a little bit confusing because it sounds very similar to hospice, but I'm gonna tell you what the difference is here in this slide. Palliative care focuses on the relief or suffering and improving the quality of life for patients with life-limiting illnesses and offers support services to the patient's family. Patients of any age and at any state of an advanced illness are eligible. This includes, but is not limited to cancer, Parkinson's disease, cardiovascular disease, dementia, ALS, pulmonary disease, renal disease, stroke, and coma. And here's the key difference. Unlike hospice, palliative care has no limitation related to life expectancy. Also, there is uh, 
no requirement to give up curative care if someone is on palliative care, like there would be with hospice. Palliative care can also be provided across the continuum of care, including home, hospital, assisted living, and skilled nursing facilities. So that can be that can be provided all across the board wherever wherever you're at. Next slide, please. The palliative care team includes physicians, nurse practitioners, and a home health team. Services include assessment, symptom management, wound and portal care, physical therapy and other non-pharmacological treatments, counseling and education. Symptom management includes but is not limited to pain, that's the number one typically, nausea, breathlessness, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and weakness. And they're available 24 seven. They are also supported by most insurance plans with a physician prescribing all palliative services. So the most important thing I want you to know is that you are not alone. Um, before making a decision to move your loved one to a higher level of care, you should understand your motive, your attitudes and feelings, learn from past experiences and those of others, understand the care receiver's needs and feelings, involve the care receiver in, de in decisions if it's appropriate, investigate all potential options, and recognize the care receiver's right to take risks. Give yourself permission to feel your feelings. It's okay to feel grief and to cry. It's also okay to feel relief. There are many others going through your same confusing emotions. And the feelings you experience as a caregiver are a normal and natural response to your situation. It's important to realize you are not going crazy because you feel intense emotions. Next slide. Talk about your feelings with understanding people. There is comfort in being heard and supported by those you trust. Contact with caring friends, family, professional counseling, or support group is important. Support groups offer safe gatherings of people with similar problems and concerns and are helpful to many. Um, one support group I recently found out about that's gonna be starting this August 12th on Thursdays, every Thursday from 10 to 11 a.m. at the St. Paul's United Methodist Church right here on Breton. And that one is sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association. So that's upcoming. Next slide, please. Guilt and grief when moving your loved one to a care facility. Guilt and grief are among the most challenging feelings caregivers must face when transitioning from home to a care facility. Guilt is often tied to the belief that you should be able to care for your loved one until the very end. All caregivers have limits and there comes a time when professional assistance is best for all involved. Feelings of guilt can also be influenced by your loved one's seeming improvement after placement in a facility, causing you to second guess your decision. Perhaps you feel guilty because you broke a spoken or an unspoken promise never to place your loved one in a nursing home. Perhaps you sense that others judge you negatively for this decision or that your loved one is unhappy in this new environment. It's also common to feel a sense of relief after placement. All these feelings are normal. Beware of should statements that cause you to second guess yourself. Few caregivers are able to approach moving a loved one on lightly. Some guilt feelings are normal and not evidence of failure in any way. Grief. Grief is an emotional, physical, <clears throat> excuse me, and or a thought-based reaction to perceived loss and change. 
We grieve in order to adjust and come to terms with loss that matter in our lives. Like guilt, grief reactions are normal and to be expected. It is true that the sadness of grief can be overwhelming at times. Placement changes your pattern of living and providing care. It becomes your identity as a caregiver. An important challenge is learning how to live as yourself, separated from your loved one, yet still be very much a part of his or her life. How to overcome guilt and grief. Know that these are normal reactions that originate in the love and care that you feel for your loved one. Know that it is very common to feel conflicting emotions. It is okay to feel love and anger at the same time. Reach out to support for support from those you trust about your grief, guilt, and or any other emotions you are experiencing surrounding moving your loved one. If others in the family are against the move, learn about all your options and discuss everyone's views and feelings. Something that can be very helpful is keeping a journal. Write down the stressful events you have endured in addition to the proud moments you have experienced throughout the journey of caring for your loved one. Write at least one positive entry each day. Also think about what you expect from yourself. Is it realistic? Ask yourself, is what I'm feeling truly realistic? What do guilty feelings accomplish for me? What do they accomplish for my loved one? Take into consideration that having 24 hour care in a safe environment will help everyone involved, most of all, your loved one. Your loved one will benefit from the structure and stimulation of nursing home activities or assisted living and a daily routine in an accepting and understanding environment. This will also give them the opportunity to socialize with other people who are in similar shoes as they are. This is a chance for you to take care of your own physical, spiritual, social, and emotional needs that have possibly, most likely, been neglected. As you know that your loved one is in a safe environment where others can help provide the care and supervision he or she needs. Next slide, please. After the move, once again, accept that your feelings and reactions are normal. Be open with yourself and with others about how you feel. Allow yourself time. These difficult feelings will lessen with time. <coughs> Recognize your new relationship with your loved one. You will still be your loved one's caregiver, but others are now available around the clock to help with the physical care and to assure your loved one is safe. You will be your loved one's voice at their new home and you can make the most of the time you spend with them. I used to like to tell people that they can go back to being husband and wife again, um, rather than just that one role of caregiver, which is so stressful, and enjoy some quality time together. Try not to do everything at once right after the move, and be intentional in taking the time to do one pleasant thing for yourself every day. And that doesn't have to be anything huge. It can be something as simple as having a cup of tea, watching the birds, doing a short meditation, prayer, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Make a plan or coordinate a schedule for your loved one to have frequent visits from others as well as yourself. And you're certainly always as free as you would like as far as there are a lot of people that go to visit like at the skilled nursing facility every day. Some, a lot of people uh, spouses will be there for every meal. Some people, you know, maybe one meal. And there's there's no one thing that you have to go by. It's whatever is comfortable for you. Um, and But it's really important, too, that you are able to feel like you can also take some time off. Um, 
so if you have other family members or, or church members, um, neighbors, that sort of thing, that you can arrange some visits, that, that's helpful also. Um, take action to develop good relations with those who are responsible for your loved one's physical care. Only you know how to best deal with negative feelings. Take the time to talk to a friend, a counselor, or a spiritual leader. Sometimes it's good to just talk through the process if you're kind of sitting on the fence about something or if you have questions. Um, it's sometimes it's, it's really just helpful to talk it out with somebody. So I would really encourage that. Um, connect with other caregivers, family members, and friends. Once again, consider joining a support group. Um, these are just a, uh, this is kind of a, there are so many books on the subject, but this is just kind of a short list of some books that might be helpful that I wanted to give you. Um, I also wanted to read you, um, this is called 12 Steps for Caregivers or The Caregiver's Prayer. And it's written by Carol J. Ferran and Eleanor Keen Hagerty. Although I cannot control the disease process, I need to remember I can control many of aspects of how it affects me and my spouse. I need to take care of myself so that I can continue doing the things that are most important. Simplify my lifestyle so that my time and energy are available for things that are really important at this time. Cultivate the gift of allowing others to help me because caring for my spouse is too big a job to be done by one person. Take one day at a time rather than worrying about what may or may not happen in the future. Structure my day because a consistent schedule makes life easier for me and my spouse. Have a sense of humor because laughter helps put things in a more positive perspective. Remember that my spouse is not being difficult on purpose, rather that his or her behavior and emotions are distorted by the illness. Focus on and enjoy what my spouse can still do rather than constantly lament over what is gone Increasingly depend upon other relationships for love and support. Frequently remind myself that I am doing the best that I can at this very moment. And lastly, but not leastly, draw upon the higher power, which I believe is available to me. Anybody have any questions or comments? That was a lot to go over, kind of in a real condensed form. I can't digest it all. That's a lot to go over, yeah. And yes, if I can get you a hard copy. Yeah. Oh, sure, absolutely, yeah. Um, Can you repeat the questions, Julianne? Yeah, he wanted to know um, how would he know to get help to see what level he's at out of all those different levels. Is that that question? Um, and that would be something if you're here on the Brighton campus, um, I you can you're absolutely welcome to make an appointment with me. I would be happy anytime to sit down with you in my office or at your residence, whether it be in the apartment or the condos. Um, and I'm sure the social worker at the Raybook campus would be happy to do the same thing. Anybody else? Where are you located? Um, I work out of both here and the Ridge, but I do have an office just right around the corner there in the resident services office where Amy sits over there. And I also have an office at the Ridge, but I can get you my information. And, yeah. What are you called? Who are you called? What are you called? <laughs> um, I, <laughs> well, that's a good question. I'm actually the social service coordinator here 
for the Bretton Woods Independent Living Campus. Any other questions? I can certainly get you handouts, absolutely. I will get some for you. That was my question too. The handouts? Mm -hmm. I can get them for you. I, I get one, two, three, probably at least. I'll make several, <laughs> make sure and have them available. Um, what would be the best way to do that, do you think, Patty? For the handouts? We can, we can take a list. Take a list? Yeah, if you want to give Patty your name, I will just, what I can do is I can make copies and I can put them in your in-house mailbox. Okay. Somebody else had a question? Okay. Somebody else have a question? All right, well, thank you very much.